The book of Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1 says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. We come here together to pray and to speak and to convince and to convict and to exhort and to rebuke everyone of the presence of the Lord, of the things of the Lord, that we might be able to become perfected. And if all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose, that we may be conformed to his Son, for whom he call, whom he called, he foreknew, and he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son. If that is true, which we believe it is, because every single word of God is true, then whatever we are going through and forever how long we go through it, there's a reason and there is a purpose that God has ordained that we should be a part and parcel of, whether it's meeting here, whether it is as Jeremy come to visit once, as it has for me to come after all this time to come and speak again this evening, or to carry on at Quainton, or whatever I am doing, whatever we do, do. If all things work together for good to those who love God and are the called according to his purpose, it is not only the good things, but it is the bad things too. And we are tested and we are tried that God may be able to have us perfected in his spirit. Faith is vital to us because without faith, we are told also in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it is impossible to please him because he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God has not left himself without a witness. And the witness that we have is, as I spoke or read earlier on in Psalm 19, the heavens declare or testify the glory of God. And the firmament shows his handiwork. And when we look at creation as we see it and contemplate and meditate upon it, it is obvious that this didn't just happen from the Big Bang or something in the past and evolved into what it is now, but there is a maker behind the creation that we see and understand. We are in this building and we heard a few moments ago that it was built by somebody. Isn't that fantastic? That it was actually built by somebody which is beyond the comprehension of evolutionists, because everything just seems to somehow evolve into something, forgetting they, th no, they think that there is a maker behind everything, including the creation that we are part of. Even we ourselves have been made in the image of God. But Psalm 19 tells us that creation is audible, because their line or their sound has gone out through all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. And that is a huge problem for many, many, many people. And Romans, we are told in the book of Romans chapter 1, um, is a major, major problem because as Paul was speaking to the folk in the church of Rome, he was speaking about the un God's wrath on unrighteousness and he tells us in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. And we're living in a time of, of lots and lots of technology, lots and lots of advances in, in, in knowledge and understanding, and men are esteeming themselves, exalting themselves, lifting up themselves and patting themselves on the backs because of their cleverness in the technology that we have. We've got an example of this here tonight, all these things about us. This is the modern technology. And men are saying, we are so good. We are so good. You know, they never used to have these things in the old days. 
They were stupid in those days, but we are brilliant. We, we can do things. And they are, they, they, are, they, they are really lifting themselves up because of the technology that God has given man to understand and what man can do. But it's the technology which is good. It's not man which is good. We're told in the book of Genesis that every intent and thoughts of man is always evil continually. And God is, was so displeased with the situation that he brought the flood on the earth, except for Noah and his family, getting rid of all the wisdom of men in those days. And so it's not men which are cleverer or better or, 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 or more wise than people in the past. It's the technology that we've used. And now it is the technology that they are relying on to think that they are better than what was given. But we are told here that all heaven declares the glory of God. And people now are suppressing that, as we read in the book of Romans. People are suppressing what they know in their heart of hearts is true. And when they know something and they deny it, they are guilty of, 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 of denying the living God. When somebody is guilty and you accuse them, their immediate response is anger. They say that uh, attack is the best form of defense. And they will turn around and attack you because you are now touching a very, very sensitive part in the souls of those people. There's not one single man upon this earth that does not have a conscious understanding of God, whether it's been suppressed or whether it has not. Every single person has been born with a spirit, the spirit given to them by God. And the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes that, this, that, the, that the flesh will, or the man will die, he will return to the dust from whence he came, and the spirit will return to God who gave it the spirit will return to God who gave it. That happens to be the me that is talking to you tonight. It's not my flesh. It's nothing to do with the blood going through my veins or my muscles or my mouth muscles doing it or the mind doing it, but it's the spirit of God inside of me which is actually speaking to you. And that spirit is what is not going to go back to dust but will return to God who gave it. Every man is born with that spirit in him. Every man, every person, every woman is born with a consciousness of God. And I submit to you tonight that that consciousness is suppressed from birth by parents who are unbelievers. God is never mentioned. God is never spoken about. The church is always laughed at. The believers are always ridiculed. And so uh, you bring up the child in the ways of the Lord and he will not depart of it, but Bring him up in the ways of Satan, he's got a problem just as much as he cannot depart from that unless the Lord is gracious enough to bring him to the light that he may be able to be turned and, 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 and move away from the ignorance that is in him. So professing to be wise, they became fools. And men, as I was saying, with all the technology that we have, with the wisdom that they have, have been now become foolish because they're relying on things instead of on the Creator. And if we continue relying on things instead of the creator, well, these things will become obsolete. And AI will take over, which is, I suppose, the next step up from this. I don't know much about this. It's just what I read a little bit. And then this will become obsolete. So what are we going to look at for then? And how are we going to adjust to what is coming? We can't. We need something stable and consistent and constant to rely on. And it is only God who has given us that. We in ourselves, or James speaks about it, he says we are like a vapor. And if you look at the mist in the morning, it's there, then it's gone. It's there, and then it comes back even harder. You never know. It's inconsistent. And that is what we as people are. We are inconsistent. We struggle with ourselves. Today I'm happy. Yesterday I was miserable. This morning I was grumpy. Uh, who, who knows what I'm going to be when I go home? I'm hungry and tired and sleepy. But, but we are such volatile people. We are changing all the time, even in ourselves. We don't understand, understand ourselves. How less can we understand our wives who are different to us? And so our lives are made up of, of, of differences all the time. But God is the same. God is constant. 
God sent his son who died on the cross for us that we may be able to have that hope of eternal life in him. I've been wondering about this concept for, for many a long day, about that spirit who returns to God who gave it. Well, God has given us a spirit. Why did he do that? And it seemed to me that there's a purpose behind God in that he wants to find people who have been exposed to trials and tribulations out of a perfect environment to see where they will set their hearts upon. The book of 1 John 1, or 1 John chapter 2, gives us a pretty good idea there. It says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And how hard that is, because we have the world around us all day, every day, consistently, constantly. We use all the assets and all the attributes of the world to make our lives easier. Our neighbors are ungodly. They are worldly people. Our family are ungodly. They are worldly people. You try to minister them and they say to you, oh, your father's gone mad. Oh, grandfather's, grand, granddad's, he's lost his mind. That's crazy. Why would you want to do a thing like that? Go to church. No, 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 we don't want to go to church. What's that for? There's no profit in going to church. We're going to go and have a party. And so that's the love of the world. If anyone loves the world, we're told, the love of the Father is not in him. And, and so we need to have the love of the Father in us. But the problem that I have, you have as well, I don't think anybody who is a believer is exempt from that problem, is that evil is with me continually. My flesh does not want to leave go, and my flesh wants the world, and my flesh is hankering for the things of the world. Through what I see and what I understand, yo, oh, that car looks great. Wow, my goodness, if only I could have something like that. And we start lusting after these things when we can't really afford them, and we start wanting things which we don't really need. And that's called lusting. And the Lord says to us in his word, don't bother about it. Don't bother about it. Because when we die, as he said to that man who had planted his crops and, the tr and, and, and he had a bumper crop and he had built himself huge barns and he said, Saul, you can sit back and relax. You can retire now. Your barns are filled. What am I going to do? And God said to him, you fool, tonight your soul is required of you and whose will be all those things? And as I said to you earlier on, I've been struggling to sing, I surrender all. But I'm not struggling with that anymore. Because in my heart of hearts, I'm ready to go to the Lord whenever he says, come. Whenever my soul is required of me, because I know that this world is passing away. This world is empty. This world is finished. It's just a case of it winding down. But, you know, a huge mechanism takes a long, long time to wind down. Many years ago, I was involved in transport in South Africa, and there was a, a competitor also transporting I was living under the mountains, about three hours away from the port. This man was living an hour and a half away from the port, and he, he had more access to all the goods, and his name was Ron Bray, and he had eight interlinks. An interlink is a truck which had two, two uh, trailers behind it. It's an articulated thing, not just a single trailer as you have in England. It can carry 38, 40 tons. And uh, he was the competitor, and he was always the man. We, we must try and get some work from Ron Bay. He's got all the work. And he was transporting. His trucks were traveling every day, up and down, traveling hundreds of miles, hundreds of miles, carrying thousands of tons of goods to the trans guy. And uh, one day there was, a, there was a rumor. Ron Bay's broke. And the trucks were running, and they kept running, and they kept running. And the rumor persisted. Ron Bray is broke. His business is failing, and the trucks keep going. I thought, ah, oh, that's just a rumor, just to make us a bit disheartened. One day, Ron Bay stopped running his trucks because he had gone bankrupt. The rumor had been true, but because of the size of the business he had, it took a long time for it eventually to actually come to a halt. The world is a huge place, and God has got his timing is perfect. And I don't know how long it's going to take for him to bring everything to a close. It might be quick because God can do anything. It might take a long time because God might be trying things. But when you look at what happened a couple of years ago with COVID, who would have believed if I'd said to you in 2019, in June or July, I, 
All the airplanes on the earth are going to be grounded for three, within three weeks, within a month. And not a plane is going to be flying. You'd have said to me, you're crazy. That's impossible. And everything else that happened, we'd have said, it's impossible, and yet it happened. What is going to happen next? Because there's been lots of talk of things happening, of masks coming back in, of another lockdown coming up this winter, all sorts of threats that seem to be rustling in the undergrowth. Who knows what's going to happen, but how are we going to cope with that? I divert a little bit. And I want to get back a little bit here to what the heavens declare the glory of God to be. The glory of God is magnificent. When I went to Quainton this morning, uh, the sky was blue and it was magnificent. And I, I thought to myself, you know, how often do we look up, get up, look at the weather? Oh, dear, it's going to rain. Oh, oh it might be sunny today. Oh, well, we'll see what happens. And that is the sum total of our acceptance or our involvement in God's creation. Forgetting that everything that we see, he has made. He has maintained it. The seasons are being maintained. Summer, winter, spring, and autumn are there continuously, constantly. Though they change at times, yet they are consistent and always there. England is a bad place for weather because people go to the beach, and when they come back, you say, how was it? How was the weather? In South Africa, it's good because people go to the beach and you say, how was it? What did you do? And how long were you there? And did you go fishing? And did you go climbing? And did you go yachting? And did you go swimming? We don't mention the weather because the weather's good, because it's not a point of conversation. But God is, God is the one who is in control of everything that we see. We're told that the lion or the sound has gone out through all the world, earth and their words to the ends of the world. Well, there's not much that we can do about the weather though climate change deniers, or not the deniers, the climate change people say, no, it's our problem. No, God is in control of the weather. He is keeping it, and it will not change. It, it changes, but it doesn't, it doesn't and is not going to cause the demise of any human being. That's a lie that has come from, the, from Satan, and it is something that most of the people have taken and accepted, and they walk with it. And so those who of us who question things like that, we become the minority and we become the laughing stock, as also Jesus became a laughing stock when they took him to the cross and they mocked him and said, if you, the king of the Jews, save yourself, come down from the cross. They plucked his beard out, they hit him and they said, prophesy, you Christ, tell us who hit you. And they laughed at him, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. We are so sensitive to People. We are so sensitive to attitudes, we are so sensitive to rebuke and to uh, people criticizing us and, and, and looking us up and down and, 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 and uh, making us feel like idiots. But the Bible tells us that we are far, far more than that. We are kings, we are priests. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We forget about these things because we are rubbing shoulders with the world all the time. And when the world is in your face all the time, you tend to, well, not only does familiarity breed contempt, but if you keep company with bad company, the bad company eventually gets into you. And then you start doubting even you yourself. Hence, it is so important to be able to understand who God is and why God is who he is, and who we are, and what God has done for us. He doesn't look at our numbers, as I said earlier on. He looks at the heart of the people. We look at the, the Bible that we have been given, the New Testament, the Old Testament, the whole complete manuscript that, have been, that has been given to us, and we see what God has done with men and women over the years. We see there that there's a general revelation, the general revelation that we see of the sun and the moon and the stars and the, and the, uh, the weather as it happens and how creation grows. Everyone sees that. But then there's a personal revelation as well because that general revelation is over there and it does not really have anything to do with me. But when I come down to the second part of what he says here, from verse 7 onwards. 
speaking about the law of the Lord, the testimony of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord, the commandments of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord. Those are not objective issues, but those are issues which personally are applicable to me and my walk with the Lord. I need to know what the law of the Lord is. I need to know what his testimony is. I need to know what his statutes are. I need to know the commandments of the Lord. I need to know the fear of the Lord, and I need to know the judgment of the Lord. I need to know who God is. I need to know his character. I need to know his nature. What's the use of having a father who is always living in another country? He's working over there, and he sends money home for me to live at home, but I don't know who my dad is. I don't know how he conducts himself. I don't know what he does, really. I know, I know of people who, who, who in South Africa work on the oil rigs. I know of one man in particular who was working on the oil rigs to make lots of money. He would come home, oh, I don't know, for a week every three months or so. He had two daughters at home and a wife at home. But they barely saw him. Occasionally they would see him for a week or so, but the dad wasn't there. A dad needs to be at home. The mum needs to be at home. The family needs to be get together as a unit. So if I, if I agree and acknowledge it, yes, the Bible is true. The Bible is good. The Bible speaks about God. Who is God? Who is God to you? Who is God to me? And why should I really take a great interest in what is happening? Well, the interest is, as I said, because the spirit is going to return to God who gave it. And I'm not my own. I've been bought at a price. And I am going to have a responsibility to fulfill. I do have a responsibility to fulfill because everything that I do, everything that I think, everything that I get involved in, God is involved in as well. He has a vested personal interest in me because he's bought me. He's paid for me. He's redeemed me from the devil, from the wicked one. And now I am part of the kingdom of heaven. And so God is wanting me to learn and to understand what he wants of me. Well, you say, how do you work that out? Well, it's a difficult question and not easy to answer because it is only by faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And so we need to be always aware of the presence of God. The Lord Jesus said that God is spirit and we need to worship him in spirit and truth. In that same chapter, I think it was, we're round about there, when the Lord Jesus was speaking to his disciples about how they ought to uh, um, conduct themselves with him, that they need to eat of him, eat his body, his bread, and his blood, his drink. Indeed, they said, this is a hard saying. We can't take it. It's difficult. And many of them left him. And he said to the disciples, are you going to turn away from them too? And they turned around, or Peter turned around and said to him, but Lord, there's nowhere else we can go. It's only you. And so they stuck, out, stuck it out with the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so what about you and I now? When, when, when things are getting tough, how are we conducting ourselves in accordance with what the word of God tells us? Are we saying, well, this is a bit tough. I, I think I'm going to ignore that chapter, and I think I'm going to not read those verses, and I think I won't read that book, because I find it a little bit personal, and maybe you know, I don't really... I don't really connect with that lot. Timothy says, or Paul says to Timothy, that every single word has been written by the inspiration of God and is profitable for man. And so we need to be able to have an understanding of the whole of the word of God. We need to have each other because I don't know the Bible well enough. You don't know the Bible well enough. But connectively with what I have and what you have and what you have, we are able to bring things together and to discuss things with one another that we may be able to come to some sort of a clear understanding. So the spirit is going to return to God who gave it, but that spirit in the meantime is being tested in various ways by the things of the world to see whether we are genuine in our walk with the Lord or whether we are just using it as a casual add-on to our busy lives. People go to parties, people go and play sport on the Saturday or on the Sunday and they get involved in all sorts of business dealings. But what about the business of the Lord? Are we serious about that? And when we look at a little church like 
like, like Chartridge here, and the believers who have consistently, constantly met week after week, year after year, two, three, four, six, five, ten, and still they meet. There's evidence then of a desire to serve the Lord and of a love for the Lord. And we need to be able to take cognizance of the fact that the Lord does see and he does reward. And for a period of time, that testing and the trials go on with every one of us in various ways. I have been tested and tried uh, beyond my ability almost in various ways in the last couple of years where, uh, well, it, you know, it's been pretty tough. But um, the Lord has been good and he has kept me and is keeping me. And my hope is that one day I will be able to see him as he is when the Lord comes. We're eagerly waiting, and I believe everyone who is born again is eagerly waiting for the redemption of their bodies, as Paul says to us in the book of Romans and in chapter 8. But that day we don't know when it will be. So to walk with the Lord, the Lord Jesus said that the gate is narrow and the road is difficult. And we need to hold one another's hands. We need to keep pressing on, encouraging one another, and even the more so as we see the day approaching. We need to guard ourselves. We need to guard our ways. We need to guard our thoughts. We need to guard our conversations. In everything, we need to be on guard always. The book of Ephesians tells us that we have to put on the whole armor of God. Ahab put on the whole armor, armor that he was given or that he had, and he told Jehoshaphat that he was, needs to gird himself like a king when they went to fight. And he disguised himself, put his armor on, and off they went to fight, so he thought he would be safe. But one of the enemy went and shot an arrow, and it found a chink in the armor, and it wounded Ahab to the point that he bled to death that day, and he died. Armor doesn't help unless it's complete. And it can only be complete if we have the complete word of God that we are able to gird ourselves completely with what God is wanting. And once we have done everything that we can do, the rest is up to the Lord. And so let us serve him in faith, waiting for him to have his outworking on our lives. For he's numbered our days, and he knows the day when we are going to go home to him. He's counted them, and he's registered them, and judgment is coming, for it is given unto man to die once, and after this the judgment. I'm not going to be judged in my body. I'm going to be judged in my spirit for the things that I did in my body. And when that judgment comes, I'm going to receive a reward. Or I'm going to have my works burned up, and I will be saved, yet so as through fire. But one way or another, I will be standing before God. Not so long ago, I was a juror, and I was sitting in the jury box, and the man who was convicted was in the... In the in the little con 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 conviction, well, where, where the, the convicts or the accused is, is held. And I sat there and I was looking at him and I thought one day I'm going to be in the position where that man is and God is going to be the judge. And the jury are going to be the witnesses because he Hebrew speaks about the witnesses. And that's the most difficult decision I've had to make in my life. As I sat there and I looked at that man and the evidence was there, I had that man's life in my hands because I could say guilty or not guilty. If I said to him guilty, he was going to jail for a long time and he would have his life marked and stained as a prisoner or as a guilty person, as a convict. Or he could go free. And in the beginning of this trial, I thought, well, this is just cut and dried. You're guilty. I just do it. Just, it's just obvious. The amazing thing was that after five days of, deli not deliberation, after five days of, of, uh, of witnessing and evidence that came up and circumstances and situations, the man was not guilty. And he got out and he was crying and he, as he walked out of that dock in gratitude and in relief for what had happened. But one day I'm going to be standing there and people are going to be looking at me for an answer. And was, what is God going to do with that man? And so I beseech you, uh, 
Uh, just think of yourselves all the time. Don't do anything off the bat. Think about the repercussions. For every, for every action, there's a reaction. And the reaction from God is something which is recorded in his books in the kingdom of heaven. Our works. My name is and is written in the Lamb's book of life. I'm there. I know I'm there because he says it's there. But I do know that my works are also there. And so we need to call one another. Don't be shy about the word of God. Ex lift each other up. Take each other's hand and say, brother, how are you? And then work with the answer. So often we hear the words, I'm well, thank you, well, thank you. And you hear later on, oh, he's really struggling. But we don't want to have the liberty to have, to say in the transparency, to be honest with one another. And you say, brother, I'm struggling. Please pray for me. I need help. But I'm okay, Jack. I'm all right. No, I'm okay, thank you. Don't worry about me. I don't want anybody invading my space. That's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ is the members that I have. I've got a very, very sore leg. It's got a hole in it at the moment because I used a, a hedge trimmer the wrong way the other day and it came back and it, well, I've got a big hole in my leg at the moment and it's sore. But my body knows about it. My head knows about it. My hands know about it. And when I do that, I think, ooh, don't touch that. My body knows about it. Ephesians tells us that we are the body of Christ. If one member suffers, all the members suffer. And that is how the body of Christ stays strong. Jesus is the head of the body. He knows everything. So we need to keep one another in check. We need to keep one another in prayer, in our minds, to say, how are you doing? Life is difficult enough. The church is battling. The churches are battling. It's, it's come to the point now where if I don't like this sermon, I'm going to go down the road and hear another sermon. If I don't like that one, I'll go and find somebody who's saying what I want to hear. Because I don't want to address the weaknesses in my own, in my own lives. I don't want to get people too close to me, which is denying what God is wanting of me. And so we need, to, we need to take hold of the word of God. We need to take hold of our brothers and sisters. And as you guys have been hanging on year after year after year, don't give up. Just keep your eyes upon the Lord, knowing that it is God who is in control of our situations. And so to close, all I want to say is here, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Amen.